Hello humans, my name is Chris and I'm going to do another cold read. We normally start the investor conversation with our pitch deck via an email or an intro of some kind, which means that the pitch deck is the first impression of what it is that you're doing. Everything that that person thinks but doesn't tell you is something that you will need to adapt to in order to have the most successful fundraising journey possible. Fingers crossed this is helpful. Now, in the words of my toddler, let's get started. Museversal. That looks like the Spotify logo. And it's got Musi in it. Immediately, uh, most seasoned investors, when they see the word music, will have an allergic reaction. We hate to admit it. We're like, nah, music's massive. Film is massive. But the difficulty is this. When people talk about the size of the music economy, they usually quote numbers like $36 billion globally growing 17% year on year. Sounds good, doesn't it? Think like an investor for a second. Starbucks, one coffee company, generated a revenue of $24 billion. One coffee company. Where do you think an investor is going to put their money? Music or spread it across lots of coffee companies? for example. But the second is that there are only really four customers. There are the three kind of major labels, so to speak. They are the ultimate gatekeeper to what technology thrives and what doesn't. And then the fourth customer is the long tail, wishful thinking, naive music artist or con consumer, so to speak. There aren't many buyers, despite some of them spending a lot of money. So competition for their attention is insane. And it's not going to change anytime soon. That being said, shameless plug, at the Rattle, we've attempted 800 experiments in how to break that obstacle. And we've been successful hundreds of times. So I'm already looking at this pitch deck, thinking to myself, I'm probably going to say no. Let's examine it as I would any other pitch deck. I see 18 slides, it's quite a lot. I'm gonna scan through the deck and try and get the narrative quickly and then go back to the points that I feel are valuable to my investment thesis. The problem, it takes music creators months and thousands of dollars to create a song. Some would say it wouldn't. Uh, the fastest way for music creators to record, oh, wait a minute, sorry. Is that the solution or is that a product? Your solution is not your product. Your product is not your invention. There are three different things. A solution is a unique approach to solving some broad problem space. Your invention is what you uniquely do to address the issue. And your product is the thing that you sell that houses your invention. He's talking about a product, not a solution here. Recording studio offering real-time recordings on demand. I know for a fact there's loads of them. Providing a 20x disruption in recording efficiency. That's not a reason to make more music. More people are making more music than ever before. That doesn't mean it's good. Business model, I'm gonna come back to that. Market size. Ah, oh, there's that number. $27.9 billion. Competitive analysis, I hate those slides. Not, not gonna read slides like that. Traction, 38,000 monthly recurring revenue. Congrats. Gross margin, 20%. It's pretty low, but okay. 79 NPS, that's really impressive. Product roadmap, don't care. Okay, so some reasonable experience there. We're now raising 1.3 based on a 12, money pre, 12 mil pre-money. Very expensive round. I'm almost certainly not going to write a check for this. If you were raising 2.5 mil on a 12 mil pre, I would see this as reasonable. Now, flick test. It wasn't great, but it, a few really important things did jump out that make me now want to go back. That's not a solution, that's a product. I want to see what the innovation is here. That would be the question I would ask if I ever meet them. Tell me about the technology underneath this, because if this is just a user interface, I know a dozen music tech companies that probably will build infinitely better interfaces. But if you've done, if you've created something really, really efficient, which others haven't, then fair play. Oh, don't use 20x disruption. I'm not going to take that seriously. Uh, I don't believe this at all. Offline recording studios are becoming a thing of the past. No, they're not. They're not. Ugh. Okay, so business model. $2,000 annual subscription. The thing is, I've got too much prior knowledge of this industry to know that the likes of Cubase, GarageBand even, are all bringing in real-time collaborative products. 
and some of their products are way cheaper than $2,000. So I'm not taking that seriously. I'm not gonna look at that. I'm not gonna look at that. This is what I care about. Cost of customer acquisition is $300. Now it's very expensive. Gross margin is very low, 20%. It's a software product. I'm looking at the curve of MRR here. Okay, this came out towards the end of the pandemic. Initial launch, very good, dips, and now we're picking back up. Please don't show me that trend line. I'm not gonna take your first quarter seriously, you were just experimenting. That is a flat MRR growth. Don't tell me it's not. Songs produced, don't care. $38,000 a month, now that's, that's good. 65K monthly revenue in June 2022. That's also very, very good. So most people will look to potentially invest in something that at least has a lifetime value greater than cost of customer acquisition at the pre-A stage. But at the A round stage, it's typically 3x that most VCs are interested in. So three times the cost of customer acquisition as lifetime value with regards to a SaaS-based product of some kind. As the world becomes more competitive, your cost of customer acquisition will probably go up a bit. And then when you go to your B round, you're going to optimize it all the way back down. But your lifetime value is going to stay roughly static because you're going to start having price squeezes from competitors. So you might have to push your prices down and then you have to develop new product and so on and so on. So 3X is that comfortable wiggle room that most investors look for. 79 NPS, excellent. What I'd probably do now is actually go on Trustpilot and see how many people have said 4.9. Hate the fundraise economics. Okay, so this is where I'm at. I probably would take a meeting as both a VC and an angel investor. But as a VC in particular, I hate the amount that they're raising for the valuation that they're raising at. As an angel investor, I'm less sensitive to the amount of money they're raising, but I am very sensitive to the price that they've established because as an angel investor, I often want my return more quickly than a VC would. And the reason for that is because it's my money. Whereas a VC will have a particular cycle which they've agreed with their LPs. And so they can be a little bit more long-termist when it comes to their fundraisers. So they are a little less price sensitive, but more round size sensitive. Whereas angel investors are very price sensitive, not very round size sensitive. So I would take this meeting. I want to dig into what the true innovation actually is. And I also want um, to really understand why their cost of customer acquisition is so high and why their gross margin is so low. If they can satisfy good answers to those questions, this could be a good one. It leaves a lot of uncomfortable questions though. That's my cold read.